of inequalities locally. Um, you'll also see on the right side that we've got a question box, and we'll be um, asking you to um, post your questions as we go through. Only we will be able to see these at this stage, and then at the end we will put them to Martin and Amanda uh, and uh, get their feedback on the questions that you had. Um, you'll also see that there are a number of um, documents which you can download, which are called handouts on the right side. Um, a document, uh, two of them are the presentations, one from Martin and one from Amanda, and the other one is the um, new ASH Health Inequalities Brief, uh, which we hope that you will find useful. Um, we are also hoping to uh, record this um, webinar, technology allowing, um, so uh, you'll be able to um, circulate this to colleagues uh, and share the information with them. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Amanda Amos, Professor Amanda Amos, to talk us through the um, evidence around health inequalities and smoking. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, thanks Emily. Um, hello everyone. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be involved in this first uh, webinar. Um, the first slight hitch we see, uh, certainly the slides I'm looking at, is that the bottom of each slide seems to be slightly cut off, but hopefully this won't be too much of a problem. Um, so what I've been asked to do is to give an overview um, of inequalities and smoking um, in England, and I should it says I have control, but it's, let's see, it's not, oh, there we go, okay. So um, the presentation has is in um, three main sections. Just first of all, quickly, what is, do we mean by inequalities? Then looking at what's happening around inequalities in smoking, both in young people and adults. Then looking at what we know about why um, disadvantaged young people are more likely to start smoking and also why they're less likely to quit when they become adults. And then briefly, um, just a, a review of what we know about the evidence on what works to reduce inequalities in smoking, which Martin's obviously going to pick up on. Um, I've tried wherever possible to draw on national English survey data, but I've supplemented it now and again with some other particularly um, Scottish data. So first of all, um, oh, there seems to be a, oh, it's a very slow responding, <laughs> okay. Um, so um, you'll you may already have looked at the excellent new briefing that Ash has produced on this issue and a lot of the material um, in that supplements what I'm going to be talking about. But first of all, um, inequalities, we're talking about preventable differences in health outcomes between different groups. And as you will all know, and I'm sure a lot of this material um, some of you will be familiar with, but we know that um, smoking is highly patterned by social inequalities. And when we think about um, inequalities, there's obviously lots of different dimensions of disadvantage. We tend to think mostly about socioeconomic status, and we can measure that by educational status, how much money people have, and their employment status. Um, but also we need to look at gender, ethnicity, uh, lone parenthood is important, uh, major concerns around people who have mental health problems, but also uh, those who are um, involved, uh, in, incarcerated either as youth offenders or prisoners. Sexual orientation can also um, be related to disadvantage, and of course there's many other excluded groups. So um, what I'm going to focus on in this presentation is socioeconomic um, disadvantage, because that's what mo most of the national surveys focus on. But there's lots more information on these other forms of disadvantage. Um, in the ASH uh, briefing document. So, um, first of all, um, let's look at young people and inequalities. Now, uh, as you all know, um, the news on young people is really good in that uh, what we see is this, oh, no, sorry, I was trying there to use the cursor, but it doesn't seem, are you, Oh yes, there it, okay, it's appeared. So what we see here is this um, major decline um, in youth smoking in both 15-year-old girls and uh, boys and 13-year-old girls and boys. And this is from the survey data that's carried out in secondary schools in England. And the definition we use there for regular smoking 
is one or more cigarette a week. So it's quite a low level, but that reflects the low level of consumption in young people. So really fantastic reductions in um, smoking in young people in England and in the rest of the UK. Um, so what's the position in terms of socioeconomic status? Well, um, it's difficult to look at this in adolescents because we obviously can't um, ask them about their educational um, qualifications or their occupation. So we tend to use proxy measures um, and in the English survey there's only two proxy measures are used. One is number of books at home, um, which I think we'd probably all agree this is now becoming quite an outdated measure of uh, socioeconomic status. And the other is free school meals. And in the English data we find that there is a relationship between smoking and how many books you have at home, um, but there's no relationship with free school meals. However, if you look at the, um, the Scottish national data on this, that's called Salsus, which is a very similar survey to what's carried out in England, there we find a very clear relationship between becoming a smoker and socioeconomic status in both 13-year-olds and 15-year-olds. So in both those age groups in Scotland, because are twice as likely to get free school meals. Also in the Scottish survey, they ask about where young people live. They don't ask about this in England. So we're able to look at deprivation. Um, and what we see in the Scottish data is that, um, that Smokers are much more likely to live in areas of deprivation than non-smokers, but also that the smokers who live in areas of deprivation have higher levels of smoking consumption. So that probably means that they started at a younger age um, than smokers in areas of, that are less deprived. So that's obviously important when we're thinking about prevention interventions. And I think that um, there's maybe um, some difficulties in the, the English survey because I don't think England is different from Scotland and the Welsh data show the same. Because when you start to look at the 16 to 19 year olds, so this is looking at the adult surveys and this is the health survey for England, what you see here is a very clear gradient in smoking according to deprivation with only 14% in the least deprived areas being smokers compared to three times, uh, four times that number in the most deprived areas. And it's not something that's happening when they suddenly become 16. I think that we're just not able to pick it up in the earlier age groups in um, the English school surveys. And when you look at the latest um, survey data on 18 to 24 year olds in England, again you see this absolute gradient for both women and men, that as you move from the least deprived to the most deprived, smoking rates increase. So the conclusion from that is that inequalities in smoking it start in uh, childhood and adolescence. And some more confirmatory um, information on this is when we ask adults in Britain, when did you start smoking? And in particular, did you start smoking before the age of 16? What you see here is that in amongst adults, that those um, in from working class backgrounds are much more likely to say they started smoking before the age of 16 compared to those in more professional groups. And that's the same for males and females. So again, that confirms that smoking uptake and inequalities starts in childhood and adolescence. So what's happening with adults, um, both in terms of prevalence and quitting? and inequalities. So again, um, you'll be familiar with um, the prevalence data, which if it comes up, oh, it's not wanting to do it. Oh, there we go. So <laughs> now of course it's leaped ahead. Right. So what you see here is this, um, this steady decline that we are seeing um, in both men and women um, in Britain over the last few years. But again, this decline is highly patterned by socioeconomic status. So the latest English survey data on this from the Integrated Household Survey, again this is looking at occupation and splitting it into three groups. What you see is um, 
two and a half fold difference in smoking rates comparing professional groups to those in routine and manual um, uh, occupations, 12% compared to 28%. We can then look at this um, from other survey data in terms of other measure of socioeconomic status. Um, and this is looking at it in terms of deprivation, so where people live. So this is a little bit more crude because it's not about the individual. So obviously you can be in a professional occupation and live in an area of depri multiple deprivation, but it's a pretty good proxy measure. And what we see here on these graphs is again, the dark blue is showing this very clear gradient in terms of being a current smoker and area of deprivation. But it also tells us something um, more important. It also shows how many, what the quit ratio is. That is, how many people have ever smoked and how many of those have quit. So if we look here in smokers in the least deprived area, um, oh, back. Um, what you see in men is that less than half have ever been smokers, 44%, uh, and two-thirds of those have quit. Whereas if you look in the most deprived areas, over half, 62% have ever been smokers, and only just over a third of those have quit. And you get similar in, in women. So what this shows is that um, if you live in an area of de deprivation, you're most likely, much more likely to ever smoke and much more li less likely to have quit than if you live in a least deprived area. And we see a similar thing when we look at income, which is obviously looking at individuals. Again, the light blue here is um, smoking, current smoking, and you see this enormous difference in smoking rates. But what these graphs also start to help us look at is what has been happening on inequalities in smoking. And so these graphs um, were able to compare what the smoking rates were in 2007-9 compared to 13. And what you see here in, is in men is that in the lesser deprived areas, uh, in the households with that are more affluent, there's been a decline in these groups, but in the ones that are least affluent, there's actually been an increase or no change in smoking rates. So this shows very clearly that there has been no decline in inequalities in smoking in men. In women, um, there's perhaps a suggestion that there has been a decline in the, um, the poorer uh, households, but I think when you look at this as a proportion of ever smoke of smokers, um, the decline is not so great. So I don't think this is very convincing evidence that even in women that that we've been able to reduce the uh, the gap in inequalities in smoking. So whilst we've been very successful at reducing smoking overall, we have not really been reducing the gap in inequalities. The third thing we always want to look at when we're looking at smoking is, of course, um, exposure to secondhand smoke. And what this shows in England, it, it looks slightly messy, but what it just shows very straightforwardly is that, again, if we look at income, that the proportion of non-smokers who show levels of exposure is much greater in the lowest um, income. So these are those who don't show any level of exposure, and you show that's a you can see that's a smaller proportion compared to those in the higher income brackets. And the same is true for women. That's overall exposure. What we can also look at, at is those who did show levels of exposure, what was the mean level of cotinine? And as you'll know, cotinine um, is a metabolite of nicotine, so it shows um, how much exposure they've had to secondhand smoke. And here you see this much greater level of exposure uh, to secondhand smoke in those who were exposed in both men and even greater um, in women. And if we look at the Scottish data, it's very clear why we're seeing that inequalities um, is linked um, to secondhand smoke exposure. It's not just that um, people um, in poorer households have more people who smoke, which is the case. Um, but the level of reported exposure is higher even when there are children in the home. 
and also that reflects that when you ask, well, can anybody smoke in the home? Um, households that have, uh, from the poorest um, backgrounds, um, are much more likely to say that they smoke. In fact, it's six-fold difference compared to those in the most affluent households. So there are fewer rules, strict rules, and there's higher levels of exposure. And just to remind you that that's just a very quick run through around the patterning of inequalities according to socioeconomic status. But there's lots of other evidence um, from other surveys that shows that for every um, indicator of disadvantage on this list that there are higher smoking rates. And the ASH briefing report um, provides some very good data on this. Um, so if you have mental health problems, if you're a prisoner, uh, if you're uh, les lesbian, gay, bisexual, or excluded by other means, you have higher rates of smoking. And these are additive. So if you have several of these, it, each of those adds to your chances of being a smoker and reduces your chances of quitting. And so this is why we're obviously concerned about this as an issue, because therefore, not surprisingly, smoking then is the single most important cause of inequalities in health in Britain. And I've just put one slide in to give you an example of this. Um, and this is a Scottish study, uh, which I think showed very clearly this impact. So these were um, men and women, middle-aged men and women in uh, the west of Scotland who were followed up for 28 years. And all they asked was, um, at the beginning, do you smoke or not? And their social class. And the red lines, and this shows the percentage of people who were still alive um, 28 years later. The red lines are the never smokers. The blue lines are the smokers. And what you can see if you look at the women is the difference in those percentage of people, um, women who were living, uh, who were smokers 28 years later compared to those, so those who were never smokers compared to those who were smokers enormous difference there in survival rates and you can see here the inequalities in terms of social class but those are much less than the uh, impact that smoking had in terms of survival. The men is just a mirror image graph and again you can see here men their survival rates overall were less but again that those who were never smokers were much more likely to be alive um, in both social classes than those who were smokers. And this is the sort of evidence that helps us understand what a major impact smoking um, has in terms of contribution to inequalities and smoking. So it's not only the health impact, but you may be familiar with this, I think, really quite striking uh, figures that Ash produced last year, that smoking as a cause of poverty in Britain and this obviously then has major impacts in other ways. So what they calculated here was the number of households where um, there are people who smoke who are currently in poverty. And if they stopped smoking, how many would be lifted out of poverty because they would be then spending the money that they spend on cigarettes on, on other um, forms of, of um, uh, um, consumables or whatever. They also looked at how many the children would be lifted out of poverty and also how many adults. Um, and I think when we're looking at this as a cause, we, we tend not to think about sm the smoking expenditure as being a cause of poverty in Britain, but you can see here what a major impact um, this is having. So I'd now like to move on to the, the next section as well. Well, what, what do we know about why? Um, you're much more likely to become a smoker if you're disadvantaged and why it's so difficult to quit. I think one of the way I, helpful ways I think, find of thinking about this is across the life course. So thinking about what is it that is influencing right across from even before we're born through to adulthood in terms of becoming a smoker and quitting. And obviously that helps us think about, well, not only what are the influences, but then how can we use policy and practice to address these factors. 
So just very briefly thinking about some of the different factors at these different stages. And basically, at each stage of the life course, um, you're more at risk at becoming a smoker because of different factors. Now, this is a slide um, some of you may have seen of before, which is the review we did for the, the British government a few years ago about what influences smoking uptake. But obviously, haven't got time to go through it all. But it's just really saying one important way of thinking about this is that we need to think about what influences people at the individual level, knowledge, attitude, skills, addiction, etc. What is it in their personal environment, their family, friends, um, relationships, the resources they have that may be important. And then, of course, what's important in the wider social cultural environment, so the wider social norms, ethnicity, disadvantage, um, issues to do with supply, what the tobacco industry is up to, as well as um, religion and uh, media influences. So I'm going to be thinking about these three different levels at diff each, and just illustrate it. Um, the different stages of the life course. So even before we're born, um, we're starting to see socioeconomic influences. Um, these are the data on uh, smoking rates during pregnancy in England by socioeconomic group. And what you see here is that the patterning we see in adult is perhaps even more stark in pregnancy. So you can see that um, women from professional backgrounds are less likely to start their pregnancy as smokers and to smoke throughout pregnancy compared to those in routine and manual group where there's a five-fold difference in rates of smoking during pregnancy. That not only influences the chances of um, their children becoming smokers in the future, but 40% of inequalities in stillbirths and infant deaths in England are due to smoking. So you're already having an impact on, on mortality in pregnancy. As we move into childhood and adolescent, obviously um, there are higher rates of smoking. Smoking is more socially accepted um, in families, uh, amongst friends, in the community in which young people are growing up. Um, as we've seen, there are fewer restrictions on smoking on the home, therefore more exposure. Um, there's also, cigarettes are more accessible. There's some great new research come out in Scotland, which has mapped all the retail outlets for cigarettes in Scotland by um, areas of deprivation and shown that shops are much more um, yep, frequent in areas of deprivation than in more affluent areas. We also, of course, know that illicit black market cigarettes are more available in areas of deprivation. And young people need both of these in order to have social sales, to sell cigarettes in schools, to share amongst their friends. So cigarettes are much more available in areas of deprivation. We also then know that young people from more deprived backgrounds are maybe less aware about the risks and still see smoking as something that's positive that helps them get through adolescence as they deal with um, the challenges that adolescents face, but also still gives them social kudos amongst their friends' status. It's something that they use in their friendships um, as um, reinforcing friendships. You know, I'll, I'll share a cigarette with you, I'll, you can catch one of me, you can get one of me, you know, I'll give you one back later. And it's not only that. Um, smoking fits with other behaviors. If you smoke, you're more likely to drink underage, you're more likely to use cannabis, you're more likely to be sexually active. And that's about what young people get up into, get up to, <laughs> Get up, into, get up to in their social lives, what they're doing outside school when um, there's maybe less supervision from parents. So it's the social worlds that disadvantaged young people have that smoking still seems to fit into. So as we move into adulthood, we're then looking at, well, why is it that disadvantaged adults find it more difficult to quit? Um, and actually, on some of the key influences, there's not that much difference. The disadvantaged smokers are almost as likely to, be, to want to quit, and they make almost as many quit attempts. They also use support, but crucially, they drop out earlier. 
and that we think is one of the main reasons why we find no matter what type of support disadvantaged smokers use, they have lower quit rates. That's whether they are going to NHS support or they're trying on their own. This in part is because they have higher levels of dependence, they smoke more cigarettes, and also they take in more nicotine per cigarette that they smoke. And of course, the challenges they face in their lives are greater. They um, are maybe therefore more dependent on smoking because they have more negative life events, which are often what causes relapse in smoking. And some Scottish data to illustrate this shows um, that, um, in, again, by income, uh, more cigarette smoke per day slightly less likely to want to quit, but still very high, but more likely, uh, slightly less likely not to have tried smoking, uh, trying quitting, but not much difference in terms of number of attempts, but more likely to say they've only ever tried for less than a week, less likely to have tried for over six months. I was really pleased to see this in the Scottish data, and I don't know what the English data might show, is that um, low-income smokers are reporting their GPs much more likely to have raised quitting with them. But when you look at what they use, they're much more likely to use NRT, less likely to use Champix, which has a higher success rate, um, and slightly less likely to have used e-cigarettes. That was 2014. So, um, finally, what's then the evidence? Um, so, we've seen that this sort of ratcheting up of um, increasing risks of becoming a smoker, less likely to quit, linked with both smoking behavior, addiction, and their wider lives and social circumstances. So, I just briefly, um, some of you may be familiar with the reviews that we did for the European Union um, a couple of years ago, which tried to tease out what is more effective in helping young people not to start who are disadvantaged and reducing inequalities in quitting amongst adults. We looked at all types of studies in nearly over 20 years uh, that reported a differential effect on uh, advantage compared to disadvantage groups. And that involved over 30,000 studies. So I've really tried to reduce this just to three slides. First of all, hardly any studies have looked at this on young people. But of those that have, price and tax seem to be the most effective in reducing inequalities in uptake of smoking. In terms of school programs, the only school program internationally that showed any equity benefit is ASSIST, which showed that amongst Welsh girls, uh, disadvantaged girls, it was more effective than amongst uh, than more advantaged girls. So, and that is it in terms of what we know about young people. In terms of adults, the, um, the evidence is a bit stronger, but still only just over 100 studies out of 30,000 have looked at this. And again, tax came out, not surprisingly, as the most effective in reducing inequalities. That is, disadvantaged smokers were more likely to quit compared to affluent smokers if sm the, price, the real price went up. There was also evidence that if you targeted um, programs, in particular mass media campaigns and cessation services, you could reduce inequalities in smoking. We were interested in non-tobacco control measures because, as we know, it isn't just about addressing smoking, it's about reducing the social determinants of inequalities in health. But we only found one study that had looked at the impact on smoking and it found no effect. And that was uh, um, an English study looking at improving neighborhoods. So again, we can only draw limited conclusions about where to invest in terms of um, reducing inequalities in adult smoking. The third thing we looked at was cessation interventions. And we only looked at European studies um, because American studies dominate the research to say, well, what has been happening in Europe? And what we found there was just looking at quit rates, no 
type of support reduced inequalities in smoking. They either had the same type of support, uh, same effect, or actually increased quit rates. However, the good news from the British perspective is that although we find lower quit rates in the NHS stop smoking services in um, disadvantaged smokers, that because we're targeting those services at disadvantaged groups, that that more than compensates for the lower quit rates. So we're probably the only services in the world that can say that we are probably reducing inequalities in smoking because we're targeting services effectively at disadvantaged groups. Because if you don't do that, um, you probably increase inequalities. So conclusions um, from this. We've been very effective in reducing smoking prevalence in both young people and adults, but not inequalities. We know a lot about what to do about in reducing prevalence, but we know much less about inequalities. Um, and unless we target services, we're likely to um, not have an impact on this. So my conclusions from the reviews we did would be that we need both comprehensive approaches that reach everybody. So that would be tax, standardized packaging. But also we need to tailor our interventions, uh, as we're already doing on cessation support, um, and as we need to do on mass media. And we know we're starting to see that some types of support, like incentives, the, the Glasgow trial on pregnant women, showed that we can also now know how we can keep support smokers to keep in cessation services so that they don't drop out earlier. But we obviously need more research to help us um, know what to do, um, and we need to be doing more. But I think we also need not to, uh, in a way, beat ourselves up because I think we, um, we are only ever going to achieve partly of uh, what we want to through tobacco control alone, we must be linking with interventions to reduce inequalities generally, um, not just focusing on smoking. But it's clear that we can be doing more uh, focusing just on tobacco control. So thank you uh, for listening to that. And I'm now going to hand over to Martin. Um, just while we look. hand over Amanda, yep. it's Hazel here, uh, we're yep. just going to hand over the controls to Martin, but I thought I would, yes. I would get in and ask a couple of questions before oh, Martin do. starts speaking. Uh, and also just to encourage people to, to post their questions in the question box on the right side so that we can have more of a discussion after Martin's had a chance to speak. So we've got one question here which is very specific, which I thought I would um, put to you, which was about whether there was any data around transgendered um, smoking rates. Um, there, I'm not aware of that. Um, I think that there are, when I was looking at the English survey data, I see that they're now starting to um, analyze uh, the data by uh, sexual orientation, but I don't think transgender was included that in that. I think because no. we've been very slow at uh, recognizing that this is important to mm. be asking questions on that. So I think that's a really interesting um, point. I don't know if Martin um, One of those is aware areas of... for research, probably. Absolutely. And I think that there's obviously... Um, we that's where we where we would certainly need good collaboration with colleagues who do research in that area so that we um were raising questions in a sensitive way um because i imagine it it might be quite a difficult area to explore but maybe um studies with different communities might help us to start to get a handle on that Sounds interesting. Okay, Martin, we, I've, we've got plenty more questions to ask, but we'll save them to the end so Martin can have a crack at them as well. So I'm not sure that Martin Dockrell needs any introduction. Uh, he's a tobacco control lead at Public Health England, uh, and he's now going to talk us through uh, in, a, in a bit more detail um, some of the um, evidence-based approaches uh, in tobacco control for reducing health inequality. So over to you, Martin. Okay, um, well, I don't have control of, of my slide yet, so while I wait for that to... Uh, Emerge. Let me just pick up the uh, issue apparently, about trans Martin, apparently smokers. You, you could, feel free to pick it up, but apparently you do have control. So if you just want to give press on the screen, hmm. uh, if it's not working, uh, how, uh, if you can just direct, if you can just say when you want the the slide to move on, and we'll move it on for you, Martin. 
Okay. okay I, I, I don't have control either of the cursor or through my keyboard, but that's all. Oh, I do have control of the cursor now. Okay. Uh, so the, 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 trans, the trans uh, question is that uh, we, we do gather those data. The number of course, numbers of people reporting, you know, identifying themselves as transgendered in uh, our national services is, is very small, and that's probably because the you know, proportionately, the numbers of trans people are, are very small. Um, uh, uh, it would be very interesting to uh, look through uh, because of the kind of. Uh, ah, it would be a, a very interesting when, when when we finally have some interesting studies. Uh, I know quite a few trans people, none of whom happen to smoke. So um, there we are. Uh, so let me thank uh, Ash for inviting me to speak, and thank most of all uh, Ash for inviting. Uh, Amanda to speak. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation, a, a real tour de force. Amanda, I don't know, I'm sure people would like to give you a, a round of applause. And the only way I can think that people might do that is to type in the chat box, clap, uh, clap, clap, and then hit send. And Amanda might be able to see you all giving her a round of applause that way. Right. Um, so if I can move on to my first slide. Um, as Amanda says, we've been very, uh, oh, okay, so the slide after my title slide, if uh, somebody else could click me on to the next one. We're just doing that, Martin. We'll take back control Fantastic. and moving forward for Probably. you. So, so we'll, we'll blend uh, new technology with old technology, and I will see next slide, as we used to in the 1980s. Um, so we, we have, indeed, as Amanda says, been really uh, successful in uh, reducing uh, rates of smoking, but uh, not nearly so successful, or most successful uh, among the best educated, most affluent uh, over the last 40, 50 years. And the consequence is uh, that our successes there have um, resulted in a, a wider gap in health inequalities. And um, you'll, I've got a, a quick slide that kind of recaps some of the things that uh, Amanda was saying uh, and also feature in the uh, ASH uh, briefing, which I commend to you very highly. Uh, if any of these numbers uh, differ with either Amanda or ASH, I think it's safe to assume that uh, my figures are um, less up to date than theirs. Uh, but this, so you can, so you can see that, you know, there's, uh, as Amanda was saying, pretty much any measure of uh, disadvantage other than gender um, shows uh, higher smoking rates in the disadvantaged groups. So next slide. Please. Um, and um, so, so this, this has prompted us to do a lot of uh, put a lot of effort into health inequalities uh, work. And, uh, you know, in general, when we do uh, health uh, work on smoking cessation, if we don't design it in order to reduce health inequalities, the default effect may well be uh, that we make inequalities worse. Okay. And um, uh, so we have, uh, there are a number of comments, which I hear all the time, I'm sure uh, you hear them too, uh, which are um, misconceptions which uh, risk leading us in the wrong direction on some important areas uh, relating to health and inequality. So the first one, I don't know how, how often have you heard people say uh, smoking is re increasing rapidly among uh, girls and young women, just all the time. Now that was true. Um, <laughs> when I was a boy, um, it, it's not true now. Um, as Amanda showed you, the rates of smoking are uh, declining in general and uh, declining at least as fast among women uh, as men. We also hear uh, time again that um, there's this kind of shisha pandemic uh, among British youth. Well, we'll look a little bit more at the data because the implications there for health inequalities, I think, are important too. Getting that wrong is a, a real problem. Um, and uh, most of all, uh, we have this notion of the uh, hard to reach. Um, you know, disadvantaged smokers are hard to reach. And you know, when I was doing gay men's HIV prevention work, we, we used to get really annoyed at people talking about gay men as hard, hard to reach. Um, uh, groups for 
uh, HIV prevention. Uh, gay men generally find other gay men very easy to reach. Uh, next slide. So we're going to look a little bit at the, the question of, of gender. Now, Amanda showed you uh, these data, but with uh, 2014 on. But So you can flick back to Amanda's slides uh, at your leisure, and you will see that it doesn't quite show the widening. If you have the 2014 uh, data, it doesn't quite show the widening that you have here. But, but if you look back over time since, well, 1993 we, we have here, um, you can see that historically uh, there have been more men uh, smoking than women. The uh, gap narrowed as uh, men began to uh, quit, so the decline in, in smoking uh, really starts among men before women. Um, and then for a period we have the kind of overlapping uh, confidence intervals uh, there, so you can see that uh, for much of the period from about 1988-1989, um, through to 2004, there's no significant difference uh, by gender. Uh, we've, we, it looks like we've got a really good convergence. And then strangely, uh, and I'd be interested to hear uh, Amanda's thoughts about this, um, we see that uh, while the decline in smoking among women continues in a really encouraging way, something much more worrying is happening uh, among men. And uh, so if you look at uh, smoking prevalence since, say, 2006 to 2013, uh, you see very little decline. It's a bit of a squiggly line. It, it drops down again slightly in 2014, um, as Amanda's uh, graph shows. But um, uh, still the, the, not enough to, to narrow the gap. So the next slide is going to look at the a issue of age. And um, here we have the age distribution of smoking uh, between men and women. And, and far from this idea that we have it for um, England, this is, um, and far from having uh, a, a kind of much higher rate of smoking in young women, um, it, it's a remarkably flat uh, kind of distribution uh, from 16 to 24 year olds all the way up to 50 to 59 year olds where smoking rates among women in those age groups are much the same. Uh, but if you look at uh, young younger male smokers 16 to 24 and uh, 25 to 34, uh, you, you see uh, quite a, a, a hump. And then this gets lower as uh, the age groups progress. Um, so, so it's simply not true to say that uh, we have this uh, increasing pr problem among um, uh, of smoking in young women. Uh, and I say that not to suggest that gender issues don't matter in smoking, because they do. They matter, um, and it's important that we uh, that we understand them well if we're um, going to address them well. Um, if we understand them badly, then the interventions we're likely to uh, develop are unlikely to be uh, very effective. So the next slide we're going to look at is going to take a look a little at the data, um, ASH data, in fact. Uh, thank you, Hazel, for uh, permitting us to use the um, uh, ASH smoke-free UK data. This is just for England on Shisha. And uh, you'll see here that Far from there being this epidemic of uh, you know, widespread shisha use, you look at uh, any shisha use at all is, uh, um, and I've got here among uh, the socioeconomic uh, classifications, um, but uh, any shisha use is, is fairly rare. So only in uh, socioeconomic group D do we see uh, rates of above four percent of ever shisha use. Um, and, or, or sorry, repeated shisha use. Um, and if you look at uh, the most frequent shisha use, which we only consider three to four times a month, okay, uh, then you see that it's generally round about 1%. And uh, interestingly, we know that um, half of our uh, ever shisha users are uh, daily smokers. So. Uh, again, it's not that shisha doesn't matter because uh, if you 
look at more closely at the um, ASH data, uh, which is something that uh, Rory Morrison and Amy Grant, colleagues of mine from ASH Wheels and uh, ASH Scotland, helped me with. And we, we published it a while back. Um, we, what we did was we grouped together uh, a couple of years' worth of data so that we had a, because these numbers are so small, we needed a, a really large sample size. And by grouping all the ASH, you, uh, the ASH, you go, uh, smoke free GB data together for two years, we had a sample size of about 24,000. And that allowed us to do some uh, better analysis. And what we found was, well, there was a, a quite a marked age distribution with younger people much more likely uh, to use them. Um, but importantly, frequent use was extremely strongly patterned ethnically. So um, I I in this case, uh, this is directing us, I would say, away from uh, the well-intentioned population-wide um, education campaigns telling people you know, about shisha and, and, and that, so yeah, everybody has to know that shisha is uh, as risky as uh, tobacco smoking or cigarette smoking. Um, and uh, it moves us towards uh, a much more targeted, culturally sensitive uh, approach because really what we're talking about is a problem uh, that affects uh, certain communities much more highly than others. And you know, wading in with uh, poorly informed preconceptions about you know, the issues in the community um, is uh, not to be uh, advice. I'll give you an example of uh, some klutzy bloke who waded in uh, not knowing. I was uh, doing the very first ever clear uh, peer assessment visit uh, in Devon and uh, the team of us went in and uh, we saw that there was no talk about in the plan about any work on shisha, uh, yet we spotted that it was a shisha bar in the area. And uh, we asked them, uh, is what, why weren't they doing any work on, on shisha? And they said, well, uh, difficult. Uh, they do smoke free. Uh, enforcement work, but because the CC users aren't smoking tobacco, there's, uh, not, they can't enforce the tobacco regulations. And we say, oh, no, they, think, they might think they're not using tobacco, but I, I promise you that's you know, a, a misconception. No, uh, these enforcement officers had been in, they had checked the products, and these were tobacco-free products. So uh, it's really important that we mustn't think we know the answers to, to these things. We have to look at the data, look at the evidence much more closely. Um, so, if you ping us on to the next one, next slide, I've probably covered most of these issues. Martin, I'm uh, just going to encourage you to um, move to forward talk with your presentation. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, so, again, I'm not saying that uh, she doesn't matter. It does matter. That's why it's important we understand it well. Next slide. So, the um, other one is a, a hard to reach uh, issue. Well. Uh, in, in fact, we know that there are very marked geographical con concentrations of smoking, uh, both regionally and uh, and locally, uh, as uh, Amanda pointed out, in uh, areas of uh, multiple deprivation. You find much, uh, generally speaking, you find much higher rates of smoking. Although this is patterned ethnically, of course, as well. Um, uh, but you know. I have said before, and I will say again, uh, people with long-term uh, smokers. Uh, are not hard to reach. They're sitting in our waiting rooms waiting for us to help them. And this includes people with long-term conditions uh, who have disproportionately high rates of smoking and who suffer uh, disproportionately from smoking if they do smoke. So people with asthma uh, suffer more uh, complications, people with diabetes likewise. And we've touched uh, on the mental health issues. And people uh, with smoking-related conditions, next slide, please. That also uh, presents a kind of uh, teachable moment. Now, uh, PHE has a number of uh, tools which I think you could find useful uh, to help you develop your work, teach, uh, looking at health inequalities. Um, we suggest that you can look at it through, if you like, four different lenses, the lens of geography, socioeconomic position, predicted characteristics such as uh, sexual orientation, sex, uh, race, religion, um, and other disadvantaged groups. Uh, all of which I think will uh, provide uh, very rich opportunities for well-designed, targeted work. Um, and uh, we have produced, just back in September last year, we published uh, a series of resources uh, for local authorities uh, on how they can uh, effectively tackle health inequalities locally. And to find that, if you just 
do a search for PHE health inequalities, the first thing that comes up will be our 2014 resource, but the second uh, thing that comes up will be our 2015 resource. So PHE health inequalities will yield that. Next slide, please. So what works? Well, um, touching on uh, mass media, uh, we know it is uh, effective in general uh, for reducing um, uh, smoking rates. Unfortunately, if you just if you just do regular mass media work without uh, making an effort to reduce uh, health inequalities, you may well aggravate health inequalities. This is the default assumption I think we have to have about um, our tobacco control work. Uh, so the, the tips here are using uh, TV rather than print, intensive exposure, uh, messages designed to, to target and resonate well with uh, disadvantaged groups, and uh, emotive personal stories. Now, uh, I think some of the uh, PT does reasonably well on those, maybe least well on the use of emotive uh, personal stories, but uh, the regional campaigns that we've seen in uh, the Southwest, Northeast, and Northwest have done that very well. Um, and also achieved a kind of local flavor so that, you know, I, I, I really think it helps when, if you're in Scotland, uh, you get a, uh, a message with a Scottish accent uh, that it doesn't sound English and foreign. And similarly, that it doesn't sound, you know, if you're in New Newcastle or Yorkshire, uh, it helps to have a northern accent rather than uh, a southern one. Yeah. Um, and and uh, by accent, I don't just mean the sound of the voice. I mean uh, 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 an emphasis on the, the content. Next slide. So there is uh, stuff you can do on mass media um, locally, but uh, that requires, I think, uh, the kind of uh, super local partnerships that we've seen. Uh, so. Uh, effective in uh, the northeast, northwest, Yorkshire, Humber, and the southwest. Um, so any of the rest of you, I think, club together to uh, to do some, you know, to develop that kind of powerful program. Um, but uh, locally, as Amanda said, the most effective thing we can do um, is uh, providing well-targeted stop smoking services. Um, and in this case, uh, the illustration I've got is a, a quick service which is uh, operating from uh, the from an NHS setting in uh, Worcestershire. And so, um, you know, remember again Amanda's uh, data on uh, the most disadvantaged smokers being much more likely to have uh, had an intervention from their GP, um, engaging healthcare professionals, getting them on board. Uh, it, is extremely uh, powerful. And in an area where resources are getting tighter, we have to be cleverer, more, you know, we have to choose the most effective, most powerful tools we've got. But the only place where resources are maybe a little less tight uh, is in the NHS and on the five year forward view uh, and with these new, uh, you know, these new uh, larger. NHS footprints coming up with their sustainability and transformation plans. If you can get smoking as a priority in those, that pro uh, promises to be highly effective. If you want advice on how to do that, uh, get in touch with me. Can we have the next slide? Uh, so just in terms of uh, making the case and uh, finding good useful data, I'll do my usual plug for, for the local tobacco profiles. And you can see what we've got here is we've, I'm showing you the mapping tool um, where uh, you can produce maps nationally or uh, regionally that uh, show either by, uh, you, know, you can have by quintile or quartile. Um, the uh, rates, and this I think is for smoking prevalence, but you can also do um, uh, smoking related diseases, for example. Uh, and again, a very powerful tool if you're trying to uh, get uh, the local NHS on board. Uh, next slide. So in terms of obstacles to overcome, um, something that you'll remember Amanda's three concentric circles and there was that middle one uh, which was about the social context and that's one I always kind of bang on about um, uh, I, I think social networks are extremely important um, uh, in influencing our behaviors um, and I think some of the uh, issues that uh, were in the individual circle that center uh, of the bullseye um, 
also uh, have a kind of um, social network uh, implication, so socioeconomic status, uh, ethnicity, uh, beliefs, values, education. These uh, don't happen to us as individuals in isolation, they're, um, they're, they're social phenomena, um, and they strongly affect the uh, our, our social networks. We tend to socialize with people who are um, like us, either by you know beliefs or religious beliefs, ethnicity, uh, education, etc. So, social networks can be very useful in helping change people's behavior positively. But uh, they also, if you live in a high uh, smoking smoking prevalence community, it's just harder to quit and stay quit. Uh, it's uh, There's less motivation to quit and just too many mates offering you a fag, sometimes deliberately undermining your quit attempts. Uh, that, that was certainly my experience. So um, you also have, as Amanda alluded to, uh, good evidence on higher nicotine dependency, uh, which also makes uh, quitting harder. And uh, some of you who have heard me talk about health inequality before will remember the slide. Uh, from the Ash Smoking Kills uh, document, which shows um, uh, nicotine coating levels by uh, age and um, social grade. And you see there's a, a very consistent kind of layering by those, both those uh, measures. Um, more challenging life circumstances, too. I mean, if you're uh, a, a single mom, or if you're struggling to pay the rent, or you've had your electricity cut off, uh, coping can be harder and uh, you know, we, we have to take that into consideration and as Amanda was saying uh, easily available cheap tobacco reduces uh, the motivation to quit it, it still takes you for smoking uptake it undermines the powerful effect of uh, taxation on reducing affordability and that's because it's something that can be done uh, at a uh, super local uh, level again, not much point in local authorities doing it on their own, uh, but uh, at the larger footprint, especially the footprints we see uh, for the new NHS uh, STPs, uh, that might be a, a much more viable proposal. And second last slide, please. So moving forward, uh, target uh, interventions on the uh, evidence of need and effectiveness. Um, that's be really clear about what uh, what evidence we have about the need and understand it well and also what's effective in those groups. Um, social networks, again, I'll put in a plug there, they can support change or they can support inertia. Uh, take that into account when you're designing your interventions. Um, and system changes that are uh, underway at the moment, which we might consider really annoyingly kind of obstructive to our work, actually offer opportunities too. And my final stop press slide, uh, just to show that I do try and keep up to date with the data um, uh, report come out just, I think, today, published today, um, which uh, looks, so you can see, uh, you know, Simon Capel and uh, Anna Gilmore's names there. Um, really interesting study. You'll, many of you will be aware of the uh, tobacco control score, which is uh, the loose and raw score, which scores all, you know, all the countries in Europe on how good the tobacco control is according to a standard measure. Um, and they said, right, what would be the health inequalities effect if we were to get the full score? Um, and that's really pretty encouraging. So they did uh, their modeling, and you'll see uh, along the results, most deprived quintile would benefit more with absolute reductions from 31 to 25% uh, or 6% redu uh, reduction in smoking. Um, so uh, according to this paper, at least, if we were able to do everything we should in the use and raw scale, uh, which is say in the framework convention for tobacco control, uh, we should make a, a positive impact on health inequalities because the most disadvantaged have the most to gain from effective tobacco control. That's it. Thank you, Martin. Clap, clap on behalf of everybody listening. Um, we, we only have five minutes before the system will boot us off because it's that uh, efficient. So if I can just ask Amanda to unmute herself as well. We've had lots of really interesting questions, but we're probably not going to have a chance to, to discuss them. So we will do some um, 
uh, responses offline and, and, and circulate them to people. Um, but I just have one question here that I'm uh, sort of linking a couple of questions together, which I think is quite interesting around how we frame uh, the way that we talk about this issue. So um, one uh, listener has been um, asking about the, the framing around poverty and whether saying that more people are, are in poverty as a result of smoking will lead to kind of criticisms of people saying, you know, that people are, are kind of stupid or not taking um, control over their own lives. And then kind of linked to that, another point that, that somebody else was making about how we can better emphasize that motivation is the same and decrease the notion of victim blaming. I just thought they were both quite interesting points. Um, Amanda, do you want to offer any kind of response to that? Um, yes, I, I know that that's been raised when I've discussed this in, in Scotland um, about how people might interpret that poverty slide. Um, and th the last thing, of course, any of us would want would be any sort of victim blaming or reinforcing of those attitudes. So I think, it, yes, it's how that might be used to different audiences, perhaps in, so like local authorities um, where they're obviously concerned around uh, reducing poverty might understand that in a more sophisticated way, or maybe not. Um, but it's, yes, it's not about saying, yeah, these sort of feckless <laughs> Um, um, smokers who if only they quit you know uh, it's flipping it, it's yes how can we around to say and I think I like your point you're making there about people are much just as motivated just as much don't want their children to start smoking how can then they be you know um, supported in helping them break free of smoking and um, that will also help them address other forms of disadvantage. So I, I would agree it's it's maybe not as straightforward a message to get across um, and has to be done in a, um, a subtle way. I, I agree with Amanda, it depends on uh, your audience um, and, and so it's good to know a little bit more about them, but any local authority with a, a, a commitment on health inequalities uh, should offer you ways in there. I, I tend to tackle it head on. Um, if there's any victim blaming, uh, you don't find it anywhere more than feckless, unworthy, smoking teenage moms. Isn't that right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, they're, they're just the emblematic, worthless smoker. Now, that's just terribly unfair because the data show that um, they are just as likely to try and quit and they're half as likely to succeed. And the reason for that, I would argue, uh, is, is, is mostly about social networks because if you're uh, in an environment where 50% um, of uh, you know your friends smoke, 50% uh, of your you know, the, the boyfriend smoke, 50% of the mum smoke, it's just harder uh, to quit and stay quit when you don't have that kind of social support. Of course, a middle class uh, woman who smoker of 35 who finds herself pregnant has been facing a program from her peers for years for smoking and, and, and wouldn't risk further a program by smoking during pregnancy. Of course, I think, there's also, pressure on her I think you, you can also be more um, positive than that. I mean, I think from my experience with um, looking at in Tayside the Quit For You program in pregnancy, where mm. the incentive scheme also use social media. So you can actually um, start to shift social norms around that. And in the interviews that were done with um, people who got involved in that, and it was both pregnant women and um, disadvantaged smokers more generally, it was amazing how many of them said that people around them did support them, you know, good on you. Um, so I think it, that's where I think local level approaches can try and um, shift and support positive social norms. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you both of you. I'm going to have to close... Unfortunately, I'm going to have to close off the conversation there before we get kicked off. Um, okay. But I think there's so much more to talk about, and um, I, I, hopefully everybody has found these sessions as interesting as I have this afternoon. Uh, we will uh, put a response out to the questions that people have sent us on the um, uh, through the machine, um, and um, we'll look forward to hearing everybody's feedback about how uh, they found the technology in the presentations today. Thank you again to, to Martin and Amanda for their time uh, today in um, providing these presentations and we look forward to doing this again in the future. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right. Are we all gone? Are we all cut off? I can hear you.
I can oh. hear you. <laughs> you, you that, Amanda, and 